I want to introduce Kevin. Uh, we're just chatting. Uh, today is, you said, your three-year anniversary from officially coming on board to Ampere. So if you take a look back, how many of you guys are entrepreneurs, doing a startup, doing an endeavor? Think about what you're doing today and where you're going to be in three years. It seems like a long time, but, but it goes by so fast. We were talking, it's, it's really, truly incredible when you, when you think about what, what can change, and especially in the aerospace industry. So we're very excited to have Kevin. Uh, he's a local Caltech guy, uh, has a startup, uh, going to talk about hydro, or, uh, hybrid airplanes and retrofitting them and, and your story and your journey. So we're very excited. Please give a warm welcome for Kevin. Thanks. Yep. Well, it's certainly good to be back here. I remember, um, so yes, this, this is like a, a homecoming for me. I spent a lot of time here in, Calif in, um, in Pasadena, uh, went to Caltech, studied mechanical engineering and robotics, did my research at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, and actually when I was still working at Northrop Grumman and living here in Pasadena, uh, I would come to events here at Cross Campus and listen to entrepreneurs talking about their big ideas and the amazing things they were doing and think about what if one day, one day I could do something like that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a wonderful journey since then and, and certainly will continue to be. Um, in fact, uh, my first exposure to this whole concept of, of electric aircraft began just down the road. I mean, we could walk there in about three minutes. And it was at Le Grand Orange, uh, where my now co-founder and chief technology officer was flying back into town, and he and I would, you know, talk about ideas and just catch up every, every year or so when he, when he flew back from his job. He was working in Beijing at the time. And he had let me know, he's like, Kevin, I want to talk to you about an idea. And I thought he just wanted me to kind of give some input. But when we sat down for lunch and he had this thick stack of papers with an NDA on top, I knew something was different than the normal, the normal conversations. And he proceeded to spend the next four hours trying to convince me that the future of aviation was electric and that we were entering this new revolution and that everything was going to change. That when he looks back on the industry and he's this brilliant, uh, I mean Stanford, so you got to give him a little bit of uh, grief there, but a brilliant Stanford engineer who's like one of the smartest people in my generation that I've ever met. He, um, he's been watching this and says, Kevin, what we have the opportunity to do is build the next Boeing. Be the company that captures the new propulsion technology, integrates it into airplanes better than anyone else in the world, and then owns the industry. He wanted to go way back to the early days before Boeing got broken up. He said, I want to build airplanes. I want to operate them. I want to, I want to like serve coffee on the planes, everything vertical. It's like, Corey, okay, we're, well, I'll figure out how to implement these ideas. Um, you come up with the great technologies. And, uh, and four hours after beginning that conversation, uh, there at Le Grand Orange, just down the road here, um, I was sold on the idea that this is the single big biggest opportunity in aviation today. At that point in time, people didn't really see it around us. Uh, we seem to be the only ones thinking about it, which is uh, an exciting and scary place to be in. Certainly over the last three years, actually that was almost four years ago now, um, uh, we've seen a lot of changes in the industry. So uh, what I'll do over the next few minutes here is share a bit about the, the context and the, the meaningful uh, applications of electric aircraft, as well as some of our progress at Ampere. And, uh, and then whatever I lightly cover that you want to dive into details on, we've got a Q&A afterwards, and I'm happy to uh, either discuss it then, or if you want to follow up afterward for a coffee and a, a real deep dive, just let me know. So, Ampere, I'm co-founder, CEO, and we're building practical, compelling electric airplanes. So starting with a little bit of context, uh, I spent a lot of time in Norway. We're a Techstars company and went through the Techstars program out in Oslo. And uh, because of Norway's commitment to regional aviation, every single person in their geographically distributed country can get to the capital city and back in the same day. The, the airline which connects those communities 
Their motto is all of Norway, all of the time. If you look at those operations, it's not just about connecting the communities. It's even more impactful because medical flights connect 400,000 patients between their rural homes and hospitals every year. But it's not just in Norway. You see these in Alaska. You see short-haul flights and relatively small planes all over the world connecting these communities. For those communities, aviation is literally a lifeline. But that connectivity comes at a significant cost. The planes that we're flying are literally destroying our environment. They're injecting almost 800, 000, or 800 million tons of CO2 directly into our atmosphere. The small planes that we love and fly to our municipal airports are the single greatest source of lead pollution. 70,000 pounds of lead in uh, California alone. The communities are up in arms about the noise. This is a significant problem for the industry. And for the airlines that fly these routes, the economics are incredibly challenging. They struggle to be profitable, especially on their shortest flights. Those that survive and fly short routes oftentimes only survive due to government subsidies here in the States to the tune of $300 million per year. They're not profitable on their routes, and it's because the operating economics are so terrible. And so these are the big problems that we're solving today at Ampere by electrifying aviation. So let's talk about some of the benefits of switching over to electric, specifically to these areas. So when you switch from your combustion engines to a fully electric aircraft, you can reduce your fuel costs by up to 90%, depending on the relative cost of electricity and fuel, so industrial rate electricity or commercial rate, and your spot price fuel for Avgas or Jet A, it's 70 to 90%. So in context, what does this actually mean for an airline? Small airlines pay up to 40% of their operating budget in fuel. They're making about five, three to five percent margin on their operations in, to, in full. This is a, a significant multiplier on their profitability just from fuel cost reduction. Maintenance costs will also be reduced. So if you ever go try to buy a, a Tesla and you ask what kind of maintenance will I require, uh, I, I suppose the joke is that the only thing you really need to do is switch out the, uh, the windshield wiper fluid every once in a while. The direct drive motors turning whatever wheel or propeller that you need are very simple to maintain. The cost of maintaining combustion engines, especially when you're in the turboprop region, is half the cost of a brand new engine. And you do that every two years. So the the uh, benefit of reducing what is currently about 10 to 15 percent of an airline's operating budget by, cons by conservatively um, uh, reducing maintenance costs by 25 to 50 percent is a massive savings for these airlines as well. When you have a fully electric aircraft, you have zero direct emissions. Now, it's not sufficient to just say zero direct emissions. Tailpipe emissions are meaningful. Certainly, they were the emissions that bother communities the most. But it's also important to look at a full sustainable supply chain of electricity. What does it mean to, to actually receive those electrons, put them into your batteries? How sustainable is that? And what we're really seeing is that with a clean grid, which we're seeing growing, especially here in California, in our early applications in Hawaii and elsewhere around the world, you can significantly reduce the overall emissions of transportation in this, call it 100 to 500 mile range that you're looking at. And with electric planes, your takeoffs and landings can be ultra quiet. So think about why Santa Monica Airport is getting shut down. 2028, be its last year. I don't think that there's anything we can do to save it. I mean, certainly people are trying. The reason it's getting shut down is that communities see airports as burdens, not assets. We have 5,000 airports that are commercially viable in the United States, 19,000 places to land. Fewer than 500 are used for commercial operations, and fewer than 200 are used regularly for high-volume high operations. Where else is it, is it 
possible to get by using far less than 10% of infrastructure in the United States. It's just a, a, a shame that these assets are burdens. And when you decrease the, the, uh, the noise of these planes, decrease the emissions, it will open up new opportunities for those communities as well. So we're taking on these challenges and bringing to, uh, to bear these, these um, solutions at Ampere by being the world's most trusted developer of practical, compelling electric aircraft. So those three words, trusted, practical, compelling, at the core of our mission are also at the core of every decision that we make, every product that we want to bring to market, how we conduct ourselves as a company, and, um, and how, we, uh, how we plan to make this vision a reality. So we have a, a big vision for the future of aviation. I was talking a little bit about it before, where we're considering the, 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 what Corey, my co-founder, was pitching, were brand new build planes that were custom built, designed, optimized around new aircraft. And as aircraft designers, there are you're kind of dime a dozen for ideas like this that are just absolutely revolutionary. And while we believe in a very exciting future, our heads may be in the clouds, but our feet in our approach are, are safely on the ground. So what we're doing is not starting with a brand new plane, not starting with something that's futuristic and wouldn't fly for a decade or more, realizing the challenges of bringing a new plane to market. Instead, we're converting existing planes to electric, taking those wings that you already fly and already trust, and replacing just one primary component, which is the propulsion system. But not even there are we replacing the full propulsion system. Our first product is a half step. Half steps are sometimes dissatisfying, but they certainly feel a little bit safer. It gives you redundancy, reliability, and improved levels of safety. So we're flying this plane today. This is taken uh, up in Ventura County, just north of here, uh, flying out of Camarillo Airport. Now, this plane is a retrofit of a Cessna Skymaster. Uh, my grandfather flew a Cessna Skymaster back in the, uh, in the 70s. Uh, relatively old planes, but perfect application, first application for electric propulsion systems. So what we've done is we've taken this twin engine plane where you've got one propeller in the nose, one propeller in the tail, and we've replaced one of those two engines. We've replaced that rear engine with a fully electric drivetrain. So battery electric starting with your lithium ion batteries, pushing through a bunch of power electronics, and then ultimately spinning a motor that direct drives the propeller. It's incredibly efficient and alleviates some of the burdens that would come with a fully electric drivetrain as well. So some of the challenges we've run into over the years, battery energy density just is nowhere close to the energy density of hydrocarbon fuel. So if you're looking at the relative energy that you can carry in a battery versus your fuel, you're looking at about 1 to 40 is the, is the ratio there. Now, that doesn't sound very good. When you're actually looking at the efficiency of these drivetrains, well, then you've got maybe 90% efficiency battery to motor on your electric propulsion system, maybe 30% at best on your combustion for these smaller engines. It's lower than that even. And so that gets you closer to one to five, one to seven. And those numbers, those numbers you can work with. You could fly a fully electric plane 100 miles, or you can build a hybrid electric plane like this that can fly 200 miles. Now, that's a compelling mission that can actually be used in the near term. We're also taking an approach which is a bit practical, kind of like the Tesla Roadster. Their first product was a retrofit of an existing vehicle that enabled them to be lean and agile while coming to market with a meaningful product as quickly as possible. And it's not just the retrofit of a small six-seat plane that we're after. As a company, we're building a platform for electrification of the most compelling electric aircraft applications. Whether they start with your, your retrofit six, nine, or 19 passenger planes, or certainly looking down the horizon, bringing brand new design, fully optimized planes to market, but doing that at the right time. Once you've actually proven the technology, once you understand what it takes to get the technology through the regulatory hurdles of the industry, once you have your feet underneath you as a company. And a little bit like Tesla, we want to follow a similar trajectory. <laughs> 
So this comes with a lot of areas for innovation uh, in the technology as well as in the business model. So you've got that the heart of the new opportunity is the, the propulsion system, right? That looks like a powertrain. It looks like new batteries. You're swapping out the, uh, some of the, the components there. Business models around batteries and what it looks like when you carry kind of that fuel source with you in a different way than ever before. Very interesting, as well as the service models. If you look at how the companies that make engines currently run their businesses, well, they're servicing engines. So what does that type of a business look like when you start to switch over to electric and hybrid electric? Uh, a lot of innovation there that uh, if you want to go offline, I'll happily talk about. I'm not doing this alone. We've built a phenomenal team to go get it done. I have four Caltech people on the team right now, and I've had a bunch of Caltech interns. Um, we're, we're about 15 people right now bringing expertise from some of the world's top uh, aerospace and electric vehicle companies. To highlight a few, uh, my vice presidents, uh, one for global partnerships, Susan Ying, uh, PhD out of Stanford, was an executive at Boeing, then an executive at Comac before joining our executive team. Uh, my VP for engineering uh, was the chief engineer on General Motors EV1 way back when. He was then an engineering executive in their company for 30 some odd years before jumping into the electric vehicle startup space and then joining Ampere earlier this year. We filled up the rest of the roster with a with strong engineering team as well as talent and business development and, and, um, and other business areas. And we're also not doing it just as uh, internal to our own team. We've got support. We've got NASA and U.S. Air Force contracts. Uh, we've got an investment from an engine manufacturer, so Continental actually builds the engines for the planes which we're retrofitting. They recognized that we were pulling their engines out of planes and wanted to work with us to figure out how to maybe keep them relevant for a while. We are first-time entrepreneurs, and so with a bit of humility, we decided that we would uh, join many startup communities and join the conversations that are ongoing to hear best practices from others, to get people to dig in deep, question our decisions, and ensure that we're not running blindly or overly confident in our approach. So we're a tech stars company. We're also in the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Um, we are a member in Elemental Accelerator, which is a, uh, an organization which helps transition sustainable technologies into uh, Hawaii, and also a member of the Starburst Accelerator, the world's top aerospace uh, startup support network. And we've gotten some pretty great uh, uh, recognition. So some awards were named one of the world's top 100 clean tech companies. We were named, given an award by a group for the, being the top aerospace startup um, here in LA, one of the top electrification, or the top electrification startup back in 2017. Blue Tech Award was in Beijing as a future unicorn, which is always good to hear when you're building a company. Um, in, in Poland, we were given one of the top smog-reducing companies. So really a, a, an international recognition. But what matters most to us is not the awards. It's our customers, where we're going to be flying in that co-pilot seat. So we're talking with their leadership, their pilots, their maintenance crews, and their customers, because that is how we will build trust with our, with our end users. And trust is the dynamic which leads, to, which leads to being the market leader in the industry. And that approach is working. So we've got letters of interest from 14 airlines. We've got sales for over 100 airplanes now because of working with these customers so regularly. And they don't want to wait for new build planes to come to market someday in the far future. They want to fly our retrofits on their existing routes much, much sooner. So we've partnered with an airline out in Hawaii to do their short hop routes, island hopping, not starting a few years down the road, but actually starting later this year. We're converting our second plane right now, which we'll then deliver out to Mokalele Airlines. We're going to fly on their route uh, between Kahului Airport and Hana over on Maui. So if you've ever been to Maui and you've ever driven the road to Hana, then you probably decided you don't want to drive it again. <laughs> and, um, and this is what we're enabling people to do, is get to Hana without, without having to do the drive. I recommend doing it once. Uh, maybe coming back to them. Uh, and so we'll start this da almost daily operations uh, beginning early next year. Uh, hopefully the first flight will be uh, this, this calendar year, but we'll see where the schedule ends up. 
And so what does this really mean to, to you and me? Well, just imagine if instead of only having 160 airports to choose from for your destination and origin for an air flight, you had 5,000 to choose from. Now, that's maybe a little bit overwhelming, but it'll be very convenient. If you, if you imagine going to the airport and the anxiety that you feel over having to arrive an hour or two hours, is what they recommend, early to a flight, driving through LA traffic to get over to LAX, if it's a particularly long one, how, how terribly inconvenient is that? Imagine trying to get from Pasadena to Palo Alto. Ugh. Like, I've, 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 I've actually measured that, and you almost don't save any time flying. It's 51 minutes in the air. It was over 51 minutes for me to get from Pasadena to the airport, and I arrived there over an hour before my flight. And it took me 45 minutes to get from SFO down to Palo Alto. I, the next time I went, I drove. And it only took about an extra 50 minutes on top of what it took me to fly. It's absurd, and that shouldn't happen. And when I was in Hawaii, flying with Mokalele Airlines, I slept in a little bit. I drove out to the airport. I was running a little late. There was some traffic. I get there 10 minutes before the flight's supposed to depart. Wheels off the ground. I run up to the person who's manning the booth. I say, hey, can I, can I still get on the plane? I'm like, yeah, sure. We walk on the plane a few minutes later. That's what it's like to fly from these regional airports, from these commuter terminals. It completely changes the time economics of flight. Not necessarily how quickly you're flying, but all of the peripherals around it. It not only changes the time to fly from, call it, your LAX to total trip, LAX to SFO, but instead of driving to LAX, why aren't you going to maybe El Monte Airport? Amante doesn't have commercial services, and flying straight into San Carlos, who actually has commercial services with Surf Air. What if you could connect all of these communities, all of these regions, in a way that was affordable and accessible to everyone around the world? Now, that is a very exciting future that scales the market segment from the 10,000 or so airplanes that are flying now. Very conservatively, it doubles the number of planes that are needed. Some are saying that it's going to do an order of magnitude increase in the number of planes in this market. So a massive opportunity for everybody for improved transportation and convenience, certainly for shipping organizations, quite interesting. And then for, uh, for us, it's a, a pretty big market opportunity as well. So uh, the bottom line at Ampere, we're building electric planes that are cleaner, quieter, and significantly less costly to operate. We're not just talking about it, we're doing it today. We're currently flying the world's largest hybrid electric plane, and we're not waiting for some future magical technology to come do it. We're using what's available today in a practical, compelling way. So I'm here, happy to be back home, I feel. Uh, happy to connect with aspiring entrepreneurs who want to feel know what it's like. Um, people who are current entrepreneurs who just need a sounding board. Uh, investors who need a place to put their money. Or, a, uh, or, a, uh, or, or of course, people who are, are passionate and enthusiastic and want to find a way to follow and support. So thank you for your time. Fantastic presentation. I feel like I haven't done anything in the last three years now. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to open up to q and I'll pass the microphone to John. Uh, this is a great time to ask about startup uh, aerospace challenges, uh, converting airplanes. Not a great time to talk about your commute to LAX. Uh, so, John, here's the microphone. Okay. Let's start right here. Hi, great presentation. I ha made a point to come today. I was really interested, so thank you. And thanks for what you're doing. Um, two questions. One is, um, are you, is your business model currently to turn current planes into hybrids on behalf of airlines? Is that kind of a, a, a way in? I, I wasn't really sure kind of what the relationship was there and, and the current mm -hmm plan. And the other is, could you share some of your um, early failures and how you've, you know, your challenges and how you've been able to overcome them? Sure. Uh, so number one, uh, the, the very first earliest adopters are not going to take their existing planes and convert them because that would be a risk for them. And taking a valuable asset 
Oftentimes, they don't have extra planes. And so uh, what they're looking for us to do is to go acquire a secondhand plane, to convert it, and then just resell it back to them after upgrading it. That's not necessarily where we'll be forever. Um, a number of airlines have talked to us about after kind of proving the concept with them on a few additional planes, then they would want to back retrofit or upgrade their existing fleet. And so that, that's a likely next step. If you kind of take one, like zoom out just a little bit from there, you also see that instead of having secondhand planes, well, every combustion plane will become obsolete based on the technology that we're bringing to market. And the aircraft manufacturers will recognize that as well, and many are already recognizing that. So our opportunity is not just to take the secondhand planes, but to look at the, the primary production of planes in their original configuration, maybe they were combustion, but some, some modifications on that production line might be able to give meaningful hybrid or fully electric options there. And, um, and so that's, that's what, but the model right now is secondhand planes. Um, early failures. Uh, well, we certainly don't have time to cover all of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, well, I'll say it's not, I don't, I don't perceive it as failures. I perceive it as like I've learned a lot, right? And, and we, as a company, like our operating principles, every Friday I remind our team, we're here to, with humility, do things that have never been done before. And what that means is we need to embrace opportunities to learn uh, where we set hypotheses and we prove ourselves wrong pretty often. And... Um, and the biggest first one is we started off with a our first product and our first patent even is a vertical takeoff and landing supersonic fully electric jet. Now that's pretty exciting, uh, <laughs> but is it going to happen in the next ten years? Maybe not, right? And and the, the the earliest challenges for us were really in this 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 intricate dance between what the technology actually enabled, what the market needed, and what regulators would ever approve. And that led to a lot of dead ends and a lot of, call it failure of ideas, but success is growing as a company. It led us to not go for vertical takeoff and landing because we can build the underlying capability for those planes without actually having to implement them and, and risk our, our company on, on bringing one of those to market. Um, uh, when, when building a team, uh, there's, a, there's a whole element of building the right culture and surrounding yourself with the right, um, the right kind of motivating factors. And, uh, it's, and it's not all about just hiring the right people. It's also about recognizing when the, the people that you have aren't always the right ones. And as you move through the stages, and that's been, uh, it's been challenging and, uh, and really um, kind of... Uh, uh, interesting going through that and then working with the on on how do we build out the company we ran into a few challenges and had some people who um, weren't ideal for the company and um, and so I've shifted things there uh, and uh, other other big things I mean I uh, not off the top of my head but maybe offline I can share more over here Hey, great presentation. Thanks. And very compelling. I love the way you laid out all the facts and the percentages. One question I had, is there a weight difference between the propulsion systems? And the second one, we're thinking about the Bahamas a lot right now. Mm -hmm. Is there some way that having electricity rather than gasoline could help in an emergency? Absolutely. So um, let's start with the first question, weight so the, uh, in, in, in this aircraft, what we're doing is we're pulling out one of the engines and then replacing it with, a, a, with the propulsion system, the electric propulsion unit. Um, the, the electric propulsion unit components, not including the battery pack, are lighter than the engine that we're replacing. Um, that actually has some negative effects because the weight and balance of the planes change. So you've got to work with that. Uh, the, the battery pack offsets fuel. And so you're decreasing the max amount of fuel that you'd put into the plane, still staying within the weight constraints, the takeoff and landing weight constraints of the plane, um, but ultimately reducing the total amount of energy stored on the vehicle. Um, but yeah, the engine, uh, electric engines are lighter than the combustion engines, and the, the battery pack will weigh about the same as the fuel, but will carry less energy for that weight. Uh, for the Bahamas... 
Absolutely. I mean, just just three months ago, I was down in St. Thomas talking about disaster relief recovery for St. Thomas, which really got hit 2017, Puerto Rico, which was also in recovery. These these post disaster recovery efforts are not just about rebuilding, but about building resiliency to future uh, future impacts. The the cost of getting fuel onto these air, these these uh, islands, especially is is extreme oftentimes they're flying fuel in so just imagine if you fly the fuel twice it's like twice baked potato it's more expensive um maybe uh the uh the but the fuel is just is very challenging for them to get is also very expensive and that um in many parts of the world just unavailable like you can't get aviation fuel there um this allow going to electric allows for an energy independent stance for these areas where maybe they've got plenty of sunshine and could get sustainable, uh, clean energy into a local local grid um, that then could charge these planes. I mean, that's certainly a future we're looking at um, and one that they seem to be very interested in so that they're, they're more independent on their energy sources. Right here. Um, I'm especially interested in what you're doing because I work with CEOs on Kauai once a month. Cool. Um, and so uh, um, I'm assuming that Mokuleli is your first commercial adventure and that you've got some strategic objectives that will take you um, much further than just from Tuhana and back. Mm-hmm. So tell us, what, what are the plans and how does that fit in with your bigger scheme? Yeah, so Mokalele will be the first airline that we're doing these pilot projects with. Um, they fly between all the islands and almost all the islands in Hawaii, and then they've got uh, a few routes here in California. They generally fly the, a nine-passenger plane, a caravan, which is not what we're flying right now. We're flying a smaller six. So when we scale up to that larger plane that aligns with their fleet, that's when we would actually implement onto their routes. What you look at is for routes which are generally uh, low profitability routes, so ones that, like, for example, the one to Hana only flies at in the morning once and in the evening once. Well, what if you could fly that five times a day profitably? Um, or what if you could start turning some of these into bus routes for local commuters, who people who live on the on in Oahu, but have run businesses over in Maui or or or, or other islands within the uh, the network there. Um, so that's what we're looking at is, is how do you integrate, either augment the route structure by adding new routes or for Mokalele because they hit most of the airports there. It's really about increasing frequency and convenience. Um, and uh, for, for each airline, we kind of look at their, their route structure similarly. Back here. Hey. Hi. Um, first of all, fantastic presentation. I, I can see myself get in the fast pass to go to LAX and just go straight to the plane, right? <laughs> the Ampere fast pass. Yeah. Um, anyways, I was wondering, um, I, I don't know anything about this technology, okay? And I was thinking about getting solar panels in my house, right? And we needed so many that we couldn't cover enough of the roof for the uh, power that we needed. Mm-hmm. So I was talking to a friend and they said, hey, but have you considered the environmental impact of the production and the lifespan and the disposal of those panels. And so I'm, I'm seeing how you're comparing uh, those uh, particular issues while flying a plane. And now I wonder what happens with the technology that you're creating, how does that impact the environment? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, understanding the, the environmental impact of your supply chain is a very important feature of being a company that has sustainability at, at, at its core, right? Um, there are concerns over how is lithium coming to you. I, uh, copper mining is not very friendly. Uh, the production of a new vehicle that didn't need to be produced is worse than using, like for cars, like throwing away an old car and then paying in environmental cost for the production of a new electric vehicle doesn't overall save emissions, right? And if you're looking at the full life cycle of the production. So the question is when you're offsetting planes that would already be produced, or if you are, um, if you are, uh, are 
are able to so significantly reduce the operating emissions that it, it effectively pays for even the production of the of the vehicle itself. So we are uh, very cognizant of our supply chain. I'll say it's not an area where I've got specific numbers. Just we're too early to have really paid um, to, to put in the detailed uh, assessment there. Uh, it's certainly on our mind. So. Thanks for your talk. Um, how are you guys dealing with the pressurization changes with the batteries and normalizing them for altitude? Uh, so the uh, lithium-ion batteries uh, that we're using don't really have much of an, an issue. So the, the pressurization, uh, generally we're looking at the, the temperature changes at altitude. Um, the, these planes, especially in their, the first category of planes that we're flying, rarely get above about 10,000 feet. And so um, you uh, have, just by operational envelope, you've mitigated a lot of the other challenges that you might have, either with, call it battery pressurization, some of the temperature, some of the like uh, atmospheric properties, which might cause arcing if you're at like 60,000 feet, are ones that we are not yet having to solve uh, directly, but we've seen others solve and believe that it, it would not be a continuing problem. Yeah. Um, two questions. Is there retraining for the pilots? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I don't know much about flying, but what happens if the battery doesn't work that day? You're up there, and I know a lot of these small planes kind of fly them. They're aerodynamically able mm -hmm. to kind of fly themselves, but, um, you know, do they just drop? Is that what happens? <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily, no. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's actually it's actually a pretty common question. It's like, well, the range anxiety. I mean, if you've got a two hundred mile Tesla and and that two hundred at the end of that two hundred miles, you stop, right? Well, with the FAA, if I say that you can fly two hundred miles, you don't stop at two hundred. The FAA requires that I give you thirty minutes of extra reserve time on top of my stated range plus the ability to divert a landing and fly away. In a lot of these cases, you carry as much reserve energy as you do operational energy. So that, from a planning aspect, also, you're, you're, unless you're maybe a private pilot wanting to buy a $100 hamburger, you're not just flying willy-nilly everywhere. You know kind of where you're going to go. You know the weather. You've done a lot of diligence. Oftentimes, you're a trained pilot. Um, that is uh, trained in a, in, in a fleet operator, so very uh, kind of rigorous approach to the flight. Uh, so your energy utilization is also not really unknown. So every flight, you are required to assess how much fuel you need. Similarly, you'll, you'll be required to assess how much electricity. So the planning part is, uh, is relatively low risk. Um, now, the question of unknowns. What if something goes wrong, right? What if the... Uh, what if the engine fails? Well, you know, the plane that we're flying today, we have idled or, or effectively shut down the power on the combustion engine and flown just with electric and actually increased in altitude. So full capability of flying. We did the same with our electric system, shut that down and flew on just the nose. And we were able to fly completely safely. So this plane is fully redundant. And that was part of the reason we chose this aircraft and this architecture, is graceful degradation in the case that something un, uh, unknown happened and we had to shut down the system or if it automatically shut down. Uh, single engine failure, or a failure of the engine in a single engine plane is a big risk in the industry. If you look at private pilot accidents, uh, a lot of it comes from fuel mismanagement, which is something we also get rid of because you don't have to, you know, change the the fuel to air ratios in these uh, electric airplanes. But the um, those like I, I've talked to so many pilots who are just <clears throat> they're so excited to have redundancy, even if it's just the ability to to maintain altitude and cruise to a safe landing spot. Uh, people who have told stories of their recovery after crashing a plane when the combustion engine failed on them. Um, it's a, a real risk, and, and actually, if I'm, I want to prove it through data, but the electric propulsion systems are going to be more reliable and decrease the failure rate and, and safety risks of, of flying these planes uh, eventually. For now, we're just bridging with the hybrid. Right. <clears throat> I missed your first question, but we can we can talk about it after. <clears throat> Hi, um, sort of follow on on that. 
outside of figuring out the technology, and you talked a little bit about the dance around the technology and regulation, et cetera, um, what are big things that have to change kind of in the world for your kind of big scale plan to work? Like, is, is regulation where it needs to be to open up all those small airplane, uh, airports you were talking about? Is there big consumer education that needs to happen? Like, what, what are the kind of big things that need to work alongside what you're doing? Yeah, so the biggest one is regulatory. When we started the company in 2016, you were not allowed to certify an electric airplane. There was structurally or just no way to certify it under the existing regulations. By late 2017, it had been approved and passed into law. So big win for the whole industry in late 2017, where aircraft up to 19 passengers, or about 19,000 pounds, are allowed to be certified with the FAA for commercial operation with electric or hybrid electric propulsion systems. That's a massive win and, and really opened up the gate for us. You need to see similar laws, uh, regulations passing in other parts of the world. Luckily, the FAA is kind of one of the most strict groups out there. And so there's not a handshake agreement that just passes it directly over to Europe or to China or to other markets, but it's, it's pretty, pretty quick on that transition. We still need to see that transition in a, in a few markets around the world. Uh, it, that specifically allows or limits planes up to 19 passengers. So what about the, what about the 40 passenger planes? Like the ones actually flying in Norway are about 40 passengers. They say they want 40 passenger planes. I say I can't. Uh, so how do we get there? Well, it's through regulatory modifications, right? Whether those are just one-off waivers for early, uh, early adoption or more fundamental shifts in the regulations. The, the challenge is that the next category up is a big category and actually touches a lot of the, the major transport planes. And so it's hard to change those regulations, and, and obviously they want to do it well and right. I expect that that'll go pretty slowly. So for the next decade or so, I predict we will be in this 19-passenger and below market. Um, and so the, I would say that that's the biggest one. Uh, passenger perceptions, customer, I mean, these the airlines are going to eat it up. Uh, they're, they're struggling so much with economics. And the fact that this is not just a, a it, good for the environment statement, but it's a good, good for business, good economics, uh, will, will lead to rapid adoption. So yeah, that, that probably won't have to have too many external factors there. Hi. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, Pat Holmes. So first time CEO, first time founder, you mentioned joining accelerators and incubators. Um, there are a lot of great books that you c might have used, like Lean Startup or The Hard Thing About Hard Things. So what what resources do you recommend to other first-time entrepreneurs or, or what books, what resources, what kind of advice do you give? Yeah, um, I, I absolutely recommend finding a small group of people who you trust, who are going through the same kind of the same phases, maybe a few a little bit earlier, maybe a few a little bit later. There's no better way to grow than to teach. And there's no better way to learn than to talk to somebody who's very recently been through it. I think that, I mean, I've read a lot of the books. Um, a, uh, I mean, like we, a Lean Startup motivated me to shift our whole company's approach toward a, a leaner, iterative, validated, learning-driven approach. Um, the, 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 a lot of books, uh, obviously, I've, I'm an advocate for Lacey and for Techstars and for Starburst and for Elemental and Village Capital. And we've surrounded ourselves with these groups. But really, it's, it's less those programs and more just with humility, put yourself in, in groups that you can talk to people, where you can be honest about the challenges you're having, where being a founder, CEO, uh, is like very isolating and you need somebody who you can talk to candidly and get candid feedback, um, the biggest recommendation would be to just find groups, people who you can um, who talk with. And if you haven't read the book, then they've probably read the book and you can make sure to get the right information at the right time through those uh, relationships. Kevin, mm -hmm. nicely done, Kevin. Thanks. Uh, so tell us about the revenue model uh, for the propulsion system. Will, do you, will you lease it? Uh, how will it work? Yeah, so baseline, again, for the earliest customers, we're selling the airplanes. 
and then we'll have a an option that they can either buy uh, additional battery packs if they want to do some battery pack swapping, or um, or have a, a kind of power by the hour model. Uh, so it's common for aircraft engines to have power by the hour models. It's what Rolls Royce does, where uh, effectively you've amortized the cost of that asset over the operating. Um, over the, uh, the, the number of hours that it's been operating. It works really well for cash flow for the airlines. It also works really well if you're the company that understands the life cycle costs, uh, like, for example, the battery pack upgrades and the second life of the battery packs, then there's some uh, additional value you can capture. Here, if I'm saving such a great amount of money for these airlines in the fuel, then how can I build a business model that helps me Take, uh, take advantage of some of those savings as well, and that's likely through a leasing model on some of the hardware. Uh, right now, we're looking at the, just the, the, the component section of it, so upfront sale of, call it the aircraft, and then a component service or, uh, or leasing agreement. Personally, I've got a uh, hang glider with a 15-horsepower Swedish harness for it. That'd be great if you had upgrade that. The two sorts <laughs> pretty noisy. Um, <laughs> But um, let me if you speak about two things. One is, you know, what's the world of battery science look like to you? And it seems like, you know, you've got Samsung notes going up in flames. Um, you know, energy density is a key piece of your equation. It just seems like that's got to be a huge part of your future and, and, and the bets that you're trying to make. Um, and then I'd also love if you just share a bit about how much do you change the operating cost equation for an airplane? I once heard that those Hueys in Vietnam took 25 hours of maintenance per hour in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what the equation is on um, you know, commercial planes right now, but if you're burning fuel, there's got to be a lot of maintenance in there and love, love to know how much you're able to shift that side of the equation. So um, <clears throat> for batteries, uh, we're looking at it very intently. Uh, we have a, a whole projection on, on technologies that are being developed. Uh, there are modifications to lithium-ion batteries, which look pretty interesting. Things you can do, the, the, the anodes or you know, doping the cells with, with um, certain chemicals. Uh, the, there are new manufacturing techniques that are going into it. You're looking at solid state. There are, uh, there are quite a few areas that it'll grow. What I'll say is we're not a battery technology company. Uh, we assume that the industry, probably driven by um, by cell phones and electric cars, is going to be be driven to new development, and we will be on the receiving end of that, but not necessarily driving it ourselves. Um, the uh, The key for us is to build a roadmap which is um, resilient to those changes and uh, and opportunistically can take advantage of those. So, uh, like this this battery pack leasing thing that I was talking about. Uh, imagine if you can offer upgrades, almost like new iPhones, to to airlines. Now that doesn't that no one's ever you don't upgrade your fuel every few years and and the FAA is not used to companies doing that but these are these are parts of the business where we could use the technology that's available today but ensure that our customers have access through our expert application of new technologies access to those technologies as they come out. And so that's the approach with batteries. And that's not just with lithium-ion batteries. I mean, just this summer, we had uh, did a big report on the, the storage and infrastructure opportunities and challenges for, for hydrogen, right? So you're looking at all sorts of energy storage opportunities coming through. Um, uh, how does it look to me? It looks like a lot of snake oil. You've got to watch out for what people claim and, and what, uh, what m- measures they do and in what configuration or lab testing they've done it in. Uh, but certainly something's going to happen there, and we can't be uh, oblivious to it when it occurs. Uh, from the economics side, um, if you're just making a very simple equation, say 40% of an airline's operational cost is fuel, 15% is maintenance. Drop that operational cost by seventy percent. Drop that maintenance. Uh, sorry, drop the fuel cost by seventy. Drop that maintenance by twenty-five. Uh, and those are those are the most conservative of the the projections. Um, and that is the the savings at a very high rough level that you would see in in the direct operating cost for an airline. 
Um, we've got detailed models, if you ever cared to go. <laughs> um, sorry, we've got just time for one more question, and I'm going to go on and ask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, it seems like this is a, a pretty um, engineering-intensive company. Um, how difficult is it for you to hire or to attract engineers to come to your company, given all of the automotive uh, companies that are getting into the electric cars? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, are you also experiencing these competition poaching uh, engineers from your company? Uh, so what we're doing is pretty exciting. And what engineers really are looking for are meaningful, challenging projects to work on where they see career trajectory and, and, and opportunity to grow and contribute. Um, there is a challenge on the recruiting side because great engineers who are not yet in it or not yet committed to the mission and opportunity uh, are balancing our startup compensation versus what Tesla is offering or what some of these massively funded uh, electric vehicle startups are funding or are, are offering. I mean, sometimes it's twice or three times the salary that I could ever realistically offer somebody. It does make it challenging from a, um, bringing in engineers in competition with some of the electric vehicle, um, the big electric vehicle companies. Uh, we, we definitely have seen that our engineers get recognized by external groups, um, but uh, we've luckily built a, a, a culture that uh, people are very, you know, very excited to be doing what they're doing, and we haven't had too much, uh, too much churn there uh, with people saying, hey, I found another opportunity elsewhere. I really try to take care of them. Just yesterday, I gave two, two big raises, <laughs> um, bigger than I've ever given before, so I hope they like it. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's because, you know, we are, even though we're really constrained on resources, we're always trying to do the right thing there. Um, but uh, this is something that, I don't know, I think a manager once told me, uh, it wasn't my manager, or somebody else's, uh, that their job is to create the kind of people who will get poached, and then to motivate those people uh, to stay. And, and oftentimes that's, uh, that's not done through monetary, um, monetary means, it's through like opportunities. Cool. Kevin.
Kevin, that was fantastic.